Hello and welcome to my shelter at home office. I'm Nate Roth, the Geographic Information Officer for the California Department of Conservation. I want to welcome you uh, to, uh, to a quick little exploration and, and a short conversation about LIDAR, what it is, and how it's used. I'm going to do my best to keep it all nice and simple, keep it easy and casual, but I think that we'll, you'll see that the information, particularly the, uh, the LIDAR data and what we can do with it, largely speaks for itself. This entire presentation, uh, the, including the interactive components of it, will be made publicly available. If you do connect to it, I recommend using a fast internet connection uh, and a big screen for the best experience. LIDAR is a lot like pointillism. Now, I'm not familiar with whether you know what pointillism is, but it's an artistic style in which very large numbers of points, uh, in this case, generally little dots of paint uh, of various colors, are laid down together very close to each other. And when you take that step back, the, they start to merge together to give you the entire picture. If you stand up too close, you don't get the, you don't get the entire uh, the entirety of the message that the artist is trying to convey. LIDAR is a lot like that. For example, uh, I'm showing a, a, uh, uh, a picture, or, or maybe I should more accurately say a painting by George Surratt. It's a very well-known uh, example of pointillism uh, and uh, starts to set the stage for what I'm going to show next. So let's start looking at a whole bunch of LIDAR points. We're zoomed in a fair amount right here, uh, and I don't know I, about you, but I couldn't really make heads or tails of what we're seeing right now. But if we start to zoom out just a little bit and start to pan and zoom around a little bit, particularly along the edges, you'll start to see familiar shapes and things that we can start to recognize. This is just the entry point into LIDAR. There's a lot more that we can do with it, uh, and there's a great deal of depth uh, in the information that it can provide. So what is LIDAR? I'm going to try to keep it really simple here. Uh, light detection and ranging, frequently called LIDAR, is the use of a laser scanner to map 3D objects, generally using thousands, if not more, uh, pulses of laser from a laser uh, per second. LIDAR has many applications. Uh, surveyors, archaeologists, and many other uh, technical fields make use of, li of LIDAR uh, in terrestrial or ground applications. Uh, it's now frequently used as part of uh, autonomous driving and collision avoidance systems and vehicles. Uh, and more along the lines of what we're going to be uh, discussing today, it's used on aircraft, both manned aircraft and drones for mapping purposes. We are going to be focusing primarily on airborne LIDAR. Generally, uh, an aircraft carrying a LIDAR sensor will fly a set of uh, tightly spaced parallel lines, much like mowing the lawn, uh, to ensure good coverage and overlap between those lines. Uh, as it flies overhead, the LIDAR sensor is continuously recording the positions in X, Y, and Z coordinates of every point, everything that bounces back the laser pulse. Uh, that produces what we call a point cloud, because to be perfectly honest, it looks a lot like a cloud or points, uh, particularly before you've done much analysis of it. The laser can bounce back from just about anything. Bare ground, vegetation, buildings, trees, cars, or just about anything else. Uh, it's worth noting that different objects are going to reflect the laser differently. The strength of that return reflection is also recorded along with the coordinates of the object that it's bounced back from. Some things, like water, don't do a very good job of producing a reflection that we can use, and so we get some, some occasionally strange results uh, over water. So how do we start to make sense of these points? One of the most basic ways is to show them based on the elevation, their elevation, let's, let's call it elevation above sea level. Uh, and we can start to see the difference in color from bottom to top of trees, and the slope of the hillside behind uh, this um, my my the area that I'm the the area of sample data that I'm I'm working with here, which just in case you're interested, 
uh, is a, uh, a piece of a small community uh, around Fallen Leaf Lake uh, by Lake Tahoe. We can also display that same data using, uh, the, um, using the intensity that we, of reflection. And that starts particularly as, you, uh, as you're zoomed back a little bit to look a lot more like what we might expect a, a black and white picture of the landscape to look like. There's going to be some characteristic differences in it, but it's generally reasonably close. Uh, for example, here in this, in this case, we can start to see the asphalt paved roads, the dark roofs of buildings, uh, and uh, down along the side uh, of, of our scene, some paved walking paths uh, between, between buildings uh, and docks uh, in Fallen Leaf Lake. So, yeah, that's kind of cool, but there's got to be more that's to get us as excited as, as we are. Uh, and, and that definitely is the case. We can start to use the computer uh, and various uh, calculation techniques, uh, including machine learning and other fancy stuff that we don't really need to go into here, to start to try to make guesses at what each of those points bounced back from. We call this classification. This next view are all the points for this area that were classified as being either ground in brown or uh, water points uh, in blue. You can see that we can start to see a little bit more of the lay of the land, how the slope is uh, uh, characterizes the region. What's significant about this is these points are represent bare ground. So it's as if we had stripped all of the vegetation, all of the houses, most of the other items uh, off of the ground and we're looking just at the land itself. From that, we can start building other products. Um, in particular, a digital terrain model uh, is very, co very commonly used within mapping for a great many purposes. It gives us the elevation of the ground uh, any, at any point within, uh, within the landscape that we're looking at. But as you'll note, some of the fine detail is a little hard to pull out from just this raw terrain model. So we apply some other techniques to it, like hill shading. What hill shading does is it simulates illuminating that landscape, maybe as if it were being illuminated by the sun, so that we can see all of the detail within the landscape. Note how the roads have been carved into the landscape, the flat areas that um, that are are, are uh, pads on which houses are built, even as we move over to the side, uh, a really neat hiking trail that climbs up the side of the mountain. We can also start to see areas where or areas and patterns that may be indicative of other larger changes within the landscape. For example. Uh, a likely boundary between geologic units that follows where this stream climbs up the hillside uh, and then has a relatively steep waterfall above it. These are important, important clues to us in understanding the landscape uh, that we're working on, and many of those may not be visible through the vegetation. Other things that we can start to look at, we can use those same sets of computer-based tools to start to try to identify which of those points bounce back from buildings or other human structures. For example, here we've got sets of points that uh, the computer has tried to identify without much assistance for me, honestly, uh, as, as, as buildings. And you can see we've got the characteristic shapes of many of the roofs with their buildings. We have a bridge that is identified. Uh, and I can tell you from looking at the data in a little more detail, it's missed a couple buildings. And as we can see here, it's picked up a couple things that, uh, or here more accurately, that are probably not actually buildings. They may be bushes that, it, that it's gotten confused a little bit about. The folks that do this day in, day out, and are the true experts will be able to produce a much, much cleaner data set from this uh, than I have in, in, in this case. 
Moving on, we can start to look think we can start to think about the vegetation surrounding it. Where are the trees? How tall are they? How dense are they? What I've done in this case is taken many of the remaining points and basically said, hey, show me using darker green to lighter green from low to high elevation above the ground how tall this is. The vast majority of this is indeed likely to be uh, vegetation, the darkest green being bushes, and then uh, progressively getting taller and, and lighter green uh, as the trees get taller. We can start to see the areas where there are collections of much taller trees, areas where there are, it's much patchier, much shorter, um, that are really interesting and useful to us for mapping uh, and for identifying forest characteristics that may be important for managing this forest related to their health or to fire risk. So let's start to put all of this together. What this scene does is it brings all of those categories back together again, displays them uh, in, in, in a single scene using the, the, um, the intensity to modulate those colors just a little bit and give us a little bit more, uh, honestly, actually, I think a lot more visual distinctiveness that we can use to characterize the landscape. Uh, and pull out features that are important to us for uh, landscape uh, management, uh, whether it be forest, uh, urban infrastructure, uh, the management of, of fire, identification of geologic hazards such as landslides or faulting, uh, and, and, and many other uh, sets of, uh, of, uh, of analyses that we may need to do uh, at a highly detailed scale uh, for the landscape. Some, some neat things that I found in here. Um, we have a set of tennis courts here. We can even see the lines on the tennis courts due to the difference in the intensity that bounced back from a line versus a not line. We can start to get the characteristics of buildings. We start to see their decks. Um, there's, there's a great deal of information content uh, available here to help us improve our decision-making processes. Some other examples, or maybe I should say continuations of those examples, uh, LIDAR is being very actively used for forest health and fire management related purposes. We use it on a very regular basis for landslide and fault mapping. Uh, indeed, it's really become a, 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 a fundamental, created a fundamental change in how we do some of those uh, geologic related mapping activities because of its unparalleled ability to give us that bare ground um, image uh, or, or, or data set. Uh, of particular interest uh, are things like uh, this, this data set that came from some uh, modeling efforts uh, following the Montecito debris flow in which we have this very deep central channel that was gouged out by the flow, shallower areas of deposits or, or shallow er areas uh, of, um, of gouging along with some sets of deposits uh, and structures that were impacted by this, uh, including, uh, and sorry about that misclick, where the debris flow piled up against Highway 101. These data are also very actively used uh, in uh, renewable energy uh, analyses, such as the siting of solar and wind facilities uh, to make optimal use of the, uh, the sun's exposure or the directions of wind. It's also being used to identify areas where there may be trees that pose a hazard to utility lines uh, and should be prioritized for, uh, for, for, for remediation of one kind or another. Anyways, a little bit more information both about LIDAR uh, and uh, a little bit about me. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, and I hope that you've enjoyed this.